There's many examples of how robotics can go too far, or very wrong, in the world of Fallout. The introduction of Robobrains to the Commonwealth, Synths, and pretty much all of Far Harbor, are examples of how it can all go pear-shaped, and very quickly. In the past, we've seen the places like the General Atomics Galleria, where a few Mr. Handys turned what was meant to be an example of what robots could do for us, into a cautionary tale of what they could do to us. Specifically our throats. We usually get there after the carnage has already taken place, and today, a galactic zone is no exception. Not only do we get to see the wonders of robotics technology at their peak, we get to see them crash and burn spectacularly, taking down a pretty large trader group in operation here in the process. But wait, there's more. In addition to watching Robco drop the ball, we get to see even more vault shenanigans. Some of you may remember, over five years ago, before I went off on my hiatus, I covered vault among the stars. Well, I put it to a community vote, and the overwhelming response was, cover it again. So I will. We get to see not only experimentation on people, but vault employees as well. Within all of this, we'll get insight into what happened to this park, and the traders that were scavenging from it. In the end, we'll see that it was their greed that did them in, which isn't really that unique a tale in the wider world of Fallout, but it's still funny every time it happens. At your request, I've raised the volume of my voice in this video, as some people thought it was a little faint in the last two. Now, let's dive right in. When we first arrive here, everything is dead, burning and on fire, with the front of the park looking like a charnel field, littered with the corpses of traders and the shattered chassis of various robots. We instantly know this is going to be good. Take note that all the bodies, both human and robot, are located within the fortifications, not outside. This is our first indicator that this wasn't an outside incursion of robots from another point in the park. They came from within, which we're going to see a lot of soon. It's pretty clear the traders got creamed, and the robots honestly seem to have come off with fewer losses in this situation. On the other side of the entrance, much the same story is told. Well, except for one skeleton on a bench to the left that, inexplicably, the lunchbox and plate that I assume they were eating off when they died is still present, but we've seen weirder. Going back to the original entrance, we can find the body of Tiana Alston, possibly the only non-smooth brain to be found in the whole trader group that occupied this park. She gives us a holotape with two logs on it that begin to shed light on what went on here and ominously prepare us for what is to come. The first log occurs on the 8th of April, 2286. We are told that they have already been to Galactic Zone, perhaps more than once. She marvels at how much of the old world technology is still functioning. Though, given there's still literally Assaultrons running around the Commonwealth killing Deathclaws in stirring competitions, this shouldn't be that surprising. She wants to study and learn from this technology, but her father, who we find later, just wants to strip it for scrap. She tells us about a mainframe in star control that, at least the last time she was there, was still functional. The next entry takes place three days after they went back, and it's all went pear-shaped. She blames herself for something that happened, though we don't yet know what. Something she warns someone she refers to as he, which we can assume, and later get confirmation, was her father. They needed something from around the park to get star control back up and running, but her father didn't listen to her, and did something. Something that caused screaming. Something that required them to hide and try to run for the gates at nightfall. Now going back to where we find her and the other traders, we can surmise that this dash for freedom just didn't work. They split into groups, presumably to have a better chance, and took off in opposite directions. And they barely got out of the park, never mind past their own fortifications. Whatever occurred, clearly the robots were part of it, and the root cause lies in star control, our next destination. When we enter the park, we have to deal with a lot of robots, either spraying us with creme the knows what, or bombarding us with, honestly, what seems like weaponized quantum at first glance, which is weird as they didn't perfect that until after the war. Besides the robots, the state of the park is the real spectacle. Going up the main avenue, it's all wrecked, with most of it having fallen in disrepair, we can assume, long before the traders showed up, as the robots alone wouldn't have accounted for this damage. Just outside of the large tower, called Star Control on the right, we can find a skeleton on a bench, 
likely they were just chilling like a villain when the initial fallout slash blast wave hit. The only alternative is they somehow survived all of that and then died like this later, which would just be weird, in my opinion. Now, we can enter star control proper and we are greeted with the shining sight of the quantum power armor, which we'll get to later. From the context of where it is displayed, it seems to be implying that one was to wear this in space, as unlikely as that seems. Round the left, we find a highly sophisticated looking mainframe, the very one Tiana mentioned. Sprawled in front of it are the remains of her father, Kendall. To get more context on exactly what happened, we need to learn more about this system, Star Control, and why the traitors were here in the first place. The terminal has three options, and the first we'll take a look at is the system logs themselves. First are the operating instructions for Star Control itself, which we are told stands for Systemized Telemetry for Automated Robot Control. It was developed by Robco as a means to allow a much larger force of robots to be controlled in a more efficient manner from a central mainframe. It operates using a series of redundant cores, called Star Cores, to establish radio communication with the desired robots and the mainframe, which we are currently accessing. The redundancy nature is designed so that if one core fails, then another can take its place, as opposed to having a single point of failure, you know, like a certain other robotics management system we covered. This is meant to allow commands to be issued that are outside the robot's previous functions and protocols. We'll see later how this isn't so great. The redundant nature allows cores to be swapped in and out even if the system is still running. If there is a failure, presumably all the cores except one, then emergency mode is activated. Now. Note that it just says that all previous operating instructions will still be executed. The failure itself doesn't cause the robots to go out of control or issue new instructions, just that new cores will be needed for certain changes or functionality. Now we can take a look at the technician logs to find out just how well this system actually worked. According to the first one, surprisingly well, the only real issue seems to be from the Mr. Handys that are older models although they don't seem to be too surprised by this, and given it's a Robco system, not a General Atomics one, this kind of makes sense. They even point out how the Director system had a singular point of failure, which we saw years ago when we took a look at the General Atomics Galleria. In the next entry, almost a month later, things are still going well. The technician is surprised at this, and seems to have expected some accidents or errors to have occurred. They even acknowledge that the robots have live weaponry, it is a bit odd that they were still prepared to go through with this, despite that, given if something had gone wrong, someone could have died. They confirm that the system does have a defensive mode, and that they aren't going to test it. I do disagree with their statement that there was no way to test it. They could have just closed the park for a day, or just conducted the test in the off-season, or even when the whole park was closed. The final entry takes place on the day before the bombs dropped. Apparently the technicians had to give up their workspace to accommodate what I assume is the power armor diorama. They also have to deal with kids pushing the glowing buttons, so I sympathize. The last thing they just about got around to doing was integrating the robots in the junkyard. We know they succeeded in this, as the robots are hostile when we get there, and we can find a star core in the warehouse at the junkyard. Last are Kendall's logs, Tiana's father. Note that the date on the first log means that they were at Galactic Zone for over two years before Tiana's first log, in 2286. He says they spent three days trying to break through the rubble surrounding the gate. When they finally did, there were no active security systems in place, so none of this was triggered in response to the bombs dropping. He immediately started grabbing the star cores, as Tiana's explanation of them being redundant, in his mind, meant they could spur some. This was technically sound reasoning, but as we'll see, this line of thinking is what got them all killed in the first place. The next entry is three days after Tiana's first one, he talks about the defences we see out the front, hastily put up to deal with Coulter's gang. He wants to activate the defensive mode that we were told about by the technicians. Tiana doesn't want this to happen, as there's been way too many cores taken out. Tiana doesn't think there will be enough cores to control the system properly, and Kendall just goes ahead and does it anyway, which Tiana told us about in her logs. This presumably caused the defensive mode to activate and kill all the traitors, Kendall and Tiana included. So Star Control was a means to remotely control robots via radio communication and issue them with instructions outside their original function and programming. This is presumably why some of the older models have issues, as we shall see later in the park. 
the star cores were redundant in nature, in that not all of them were required for the system to operate. However, if anything happened, at least one star core present would ensure emergency mode was possible, meaning all connected robots and defenses would operate with the last instructions they were issued. Tiana knew this, which is why she didn't want her father to initiate defensive mode. Presumably too few cores remained, and once the mode had been booted into, the system suffered a failure, and instead booted into emergency mode. As a result, the defensive mode protocols remained in place, with no way to change them until a sufficient number of cores were reintroduced to the system. However, what it doesn't say is that the emergency mode prevents the previous instructions from working correctly. So I am left to wonder why all the robots killed the traitors. What exact instructions did they have in place that, if the defensive mode was activated before the bombs hit, would have prevented the deaths of the park employees too? Or was the defensive mode just absolute? And since it had never been tested, the technicians were not aware of this huge bug slash feature. Unfortunately, we can only speculate. Now, let's take a look at the next floor up of this region of the park, before we head to the others. Heading up the concrete stairs to the right of the stairs taking you to Star Control, we can find what looks like a sick room or first aid station. Here, we can find the remains of what was presumably a pre-war park goer, given they still have their tickets. Now, I don't know what brought them up here, but surely it was more important than keeping a hold of their tickets all the way here. If they were pre-war, I assume they died in the initial blast wave, or of radiation shortly after. At the top of the stairs, we come to a walkway overlooking the main park avenue, and to the right of it we can see the remains of someone near the escalators. I also want to take the time to point out that I won't talk about every skeleton or body in this park, because to be honest, not all of them are interesting, and there's just way too many of them in proportion to the other parks we've looked at recently. Across the walkway, if we turn left, we can find the remains of someone's camp, along with the remains of that someone as well. A woman, going off the clothing. I think this is definitely someone from after the bombs dropped. If not, then this park had some shocking security, or was just really supportive of squatting. Regardless, they seem to be long dead, and whether that is from a lack of food or injury, we don't know. Either way, it didn't work out for them. Back at the right of the walkway, we can find some more parkours that seem to have been annihilated where they stood, or in the case of one of them, sat. Likely this was a cafe area of sorts, given the close proximity to what seems like a small kiosk. From here, we can obtain access to the second floor of Star Control, which contains a few things of interest. The first is the skeletons of several people who are waiting in line for an elevator. So again, more pre-war sods. We'll see what they were waiting for in just a minute. The rest of the room is a museum of sorts. There's some flags and a power armor helmet. But apart from that, it's kind of hard to tell what was here. I would have expected a Sea of Tranquility poster or something like that, to be honest. There are some spacesuits, so the overall theme must have been related to space, obviously. But apart from that, who knows? Now, the elevator cannot be accessed until you either restore the power to the park or with a jetpack. At the top, you'll find what is likely the last star core you will need. Along with that, we can find the remains of what seems to be a couple who came up to this observation deck to get a nice view of the park. Unfortunately, they also got a nice view of atomic fire engulfing them, but I'm sure the wait in line was worth it. The last thing to do in Star Control is take a look at the technician's logs we can find just to the left of the elevator. There are four of them, outbound communications and inbound communications. The first was sent to Peyton Huxley, the executive assistant to Bradburn. The Star Control system, as mentioned before, is not playing nice with the older model robots they have, although so far, nothing serious has happened. Somehow. We then get a glimpse into just how ignorant they were with exactly what this system was capable of if it malfunctions. They believe the hardware is just too old and can't keep up with the instructions being sent to it by Star Control. They recommend a major overhaul of the hardware in question before something horrendous happens. This never actually occurred for them, either the overhaul or the failure, but it was an accurate prediction, as this is what happened to the unfortunate traitors that took up residence here at the park. Next, we have the last outbound communication. This one had been escalated all the way to Brad Burton himself, and there's apparently a crisis in the park. Now, they don't actually tell us the details of this crisis per se, However, they do complain that the older models of robots are putting too much strain on the system. They also apparently knew about Project Cobalt, so again, not really the top secret project it was meant to be. 
Regardless, they needed more resources to deal with these issues, and they needed them badly. The last two entries are the inbound ones, sent to the individuals using the terminals. The first is from Ingrid Sivenstein, on behalf of herself, Ryan, and Mark. They are fed up with trying to make star control work with the robots, and it's causing damage to many of their control modules, especially the older ones. They've also been asked to chaperone tour groups, and it's all holding up the other work that they need to get done. Overall, it just sounds like they're being asked to do too much, as well as things well outside of their job description. The last entry is from Mark Reisman to Penny, who I assume was who the last one was addressed to as well. He's had it up to here with all this shit and has threatened to quit. More and more of the units are malfunctioning, and this is likely related to star control as well. This likely occurred just before the bombs hit, given we get no updates on this, so we know the system wasn't working as well as it needed to. It was affecting a lot of the older models, and putting strain on them that resulted in them having to be serviced with increasing frequency. If this increased strain went hand in hand with more malfunctions, then it is reasonable to assume that a lethal accident was only just around the corner, and only the period of time when the system was active being brief prevented this from occurring. Next, I want to go to the left of Star Control, which is the region that the ramp we find the survivalist woman's remains on leads to. It's a small region of the park, but within it, we can find the remains of some more parkours, and one of the interior areas here at the park, the Starlight Interstellar Theatre. Down the stairs, we can find this person's remains outside the concession stand, still clutching their tickets, so likely another casualty of when the bombs hit. Opposite them, we can find a stand worker behind the cart they presumably worked at, and a pram in front of it, with no body around it, oddly enough, mirroring the one we found at the stairs. Hopefully that just means they took the kid and ran. However, the line that we find at the other side of the concession stand may indicate this is not the case. These three people look like they all just died waiting in line, some still clutching their tickets. Given this could be the case, I find it unlikely that any of the parkours that were here at the time could have survived, if all three of these people did die at the same time. Now we can take a look at the theatre. There's quite a few bodies outside of it, though whether they were heading in when they expired, or attempted to take refuge and got taken out before they got the chance, I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter either way in the end. They still died. Now, let's take a look at the theatre. As in all things, the first area we have to explore is the toilets, because they have a fabulous track record of just the best shenanigans and fuckery in Fallout. On the way there, we can find the remains of someone who was enjoying some psycho at the end of their days. Now whether it itself contributed to their end, they were trying to use it and were then killed, or they never got the chance to use it, we don't know. But they look like they've been here a while, so maybe someone that managed to get in here after the bombs hit. Or they came here before, and this is just a pretty hardcore theatre. Entering the women's toilets on the left, we come to a site that would turn your blood to ice. A site I have not seen since Fallout 3 and the plunger room of death. The bastards are everywhere, having seemingly preyed on and drained the life out of this poor woman, now waiting for their next prey. Jokes aside, from the cap stash and cans of food, this person definitely showed up here post-war. Now why they took shelter in the toilets, I am not sure, nor am I quite sure what is up with all these plungers. I find it unlikely they did all this and then just died, so I can only conclude somebody else did it, possibly after finding her, or after having killed her. As to why, they were probably unhinged. Going into the men's toilets across the way, the tale of Tom Fillery continues. Ignoring the robots, for now, we can find someone who seems to have died kneeling over the toilet, with quite the stash of jet and buff out. Possibly a compatriot of the person we found out in the hall, or possibly not. I wonder if the buff out and the jet were originally hid inside the toilet cistern, and they were taking them out when they died. It seems they hoarded a medical kit as well, so possibly another survivor. Now, turning our attention back to the robots, we can find why they were here, hidden, in this wall. It seems this was one of the traitors who didn't manage to link up with the main group in their, ultimately, failed attempt to flee the park. They were either chased in here, or the robots stumbled across them doing a sweep of the place, or they were already here, and the traitor didn't know this coming in. Regardless, they still managed to put them down before themselves succumbing to their injuries, possibly at the hands of other robots. Now, we can take a look at the theatre itself, and I'll be honest, it's kind of a letdown. I would have expected, 
given the rest of the park does have other people present, for there to be some people attending a show here, and as such to have expired in here, as it's clear from the other regions we've seen, and other parts of the park, the people are still dying even if they manage to find shelter. But there's nothing here, apart from a single cheeky Jangles the Moon Monkey, which is simply not enough for this person, who reads way too much into places in video games, and ascribes meaning to the meaningless. Outside the theatre itself, we can find the last area on this floor of interest, the kitchen. Now, it itself is fairly boring, however the storage cupboard slash freezer seems to have been used very recently, going off of the post-war plants present, and the hanging meat that definitely would have rotted by now if it was pre-war. Likely the traders had set up and stored a few things here before everything went to hell. The last thing to look at is upstairs, where we can find the projection booth, and the only terminal actually in this place. Here, we can find a Protectron that has mastered the art of phasing through solid matter, showing that enlightenment for machines only takes two centuries of meditation. The terminal has three entries on it, telling us what this place actually showed, and a little about how poorly things were managed here. Which is, at this point, let's be honest, standard in this park. The program schedule reflects that Halloween is coming up, and so a variety of sci-fi and horror movies were available to choose from. Honestly, the beast with a trillion eyes just makes me think of the painting in Pikmin's gallery, so maybe a nod to the Eldritch there. The rest of them sound like the type of 60s and 70s horror movies that I'd expect. Probably all awful, excepting of course the cinematic masterpiece that is, the saga of the Chartreuse Slime, an excellent example of avant-garde cinema in the 2070s. Next up is the first memo to the staff here. Now, on the one hand, this just sounds like management being way too harsh to their staff, and rude. However, having personally known people who have both worked in and managed cinemas, there are some total clowns there. Sometimes the level of apathy shown to the job is awful, and having the rockets filled with trash isn't great. Moreover, this is a small theatre, so cleaning them out wouldn't even take that long. The last memo shows yet more cracks in the facade of robots do everything in the park. The star tender, which is a name I love, by the way, is causing thousands in damages in the glassware, and apparently can't really mix the drinks that well. Additionally, management says it has been acting aggressive. Now, this is only a guess on my part, but I wonder if some of the instructions for the robots in the arena weren't getting sent to the wrong place, due to either too many robots to handle, or some such other malfunction. They also mention other accidents, plural, which would suggest that there have been other issues in regards to aggression at the park. After all that's done, the only thing really left to talk about in this place is this autumn smash hit, Mr. Pebbles, the first cat in space. When I saw this, I initially thought it might have been an actual event that had occurred pre-war, and this poster was just talking about it. Or at least I'm pretty sure it's just a movie, as I don't know how I could have missed this up to now if that wasn't the case. Now that we've covered the lower level regions to the left of Star Control, we can take a look at the upper regions. This takes us to vault -Tec Among the Stars. We covered this about six years ago, but after putting out a poll, the consensus was that more than enough time had passed to talk about it again, and to be fair, it has been over half a decade, so I think that's reasonable. Just inside, you can immediately tell that it's another ride, or at least it appears to be, on the surface. We will see that's a load of gobshite later on. Immediately ahead, we can find our first victim here, or more accurately, our first set of remains, as there were victims here long before the bombs dropped. To the left of them, we can find the remains of presumably two employees at the welcome desk. Now, it looks to me like they died while at work, which is funny as that means that this vault -Tec building wasn't even secure enough to protect the people in it, yet others were. There's also weirdly just a metal baton lying in a cabinet, perhaps a subtle threat to the parkgoers not to push the people that work here too hard, lest your kneecap be turned into a skin sock filled with bone fragments and sinew. Now to take the tour itself, and don't worry, I'll spare you the pretentious narration of this ride. You only have to put up with mine. The public purpose of this ride is to show off how vaults could be used to settle distant worlds that would be otherwise inhospitable to human life, either due to the atmosphere, the temperature, or a myriad of other factors. So instead, you can live in a vault. This was of course the ultimate goal of the vault experiments, 
to test a variety of environments to allow the creation of off-world settlements that could avoid any pitfalls the experiments revealed. To that end, as we know, they all had hidden experiments. This tour is no different, and the radiation scrubber that you see when you walk in is just the beginning. We'll see later what this is meant to do, but long story short, it does have a negative effect on you, and indeed all the visitors walking in here. Down the stairs, we can find a copse of dead trees, if they were ever alive in the first place. This is pretty funny as the automated tour guy claims this will be an Earth-like setting. I'm struggling to recall if any of the vaults that we've looked at over the years, barring a certain one ravaged by floral parasites, had actual plant life on a large scale in them. Deeper into this pseudo-vault, we find what they claim will be the private suites you'd have in these off-world colonies. We can also, if we strain our ears, hear something else, something strange. A whispering right at the edge of our hearing, pushing us, compelling us, to piss in our trousers. I only slightly kid, as we shall later see this is literally what this did to someone. I'll play you a clip right now of the sound, just so you can hear it. Now, I'm not sure exactly what this is meant to be saying, but I don't like it one bit. We can find out exactly what it is, and pretty much everything else, by heading into the door to the left of the one we entered from. In it, we see a wonderful sight, a dead vault employee, who, going off the tray that's been dropped in front of them, died mid-meal. We don't know why, and I'll talk about possibilities later. For now, let's take a look at their terminal. The owner, and as such presumably the person we found, is an L. Bateman, the project lead, and there are five terminal entries here, detailing five experiments. The first is on brainwave disruption. This was done using the radiation scrubbers we just walked through, so it's affected us as well. It's emitting an EM field that affects the brainwave patterns of humans that it's applied to. It causes loss of motor control, temporary stupor, and forgetfulness. Presumably, the goal was to hit as many people as possible on the way in, and have the longest amount of time to observe how it affected them, and how they developed as they moved through the tour. I feel like hitting them with the one that affected motor control when they then immediately had to walk downstairs, and then overlooking a large drop in the area with trees, is a dick move. It's also pretty funny. Experiment 2 is subliminal suggestion, and is responsible for the noise we heard in that room. The suggestions are overlaid with a particular frequency, presumably to affect the subject's susceptibility to them. Along with them actually performing the acts, it can cause headaches, depression, and other phenomena, whatever that means. All of this seems to be linked to a neurochemical release the suggestions, or frequencies, cause. We'll see more of this later on. The third experiment involves hypnotic pheromones, though I don't know what this is meant to achieve. The flora release them in an airborne toxin, and it then gets pumped through emitters to those in the tours. It causes loss of independent thought, minor addiction, and susceptibility to suggestion. It seems to me, due to that last one, this really could have been done before the room with a subliminal messaging in it, as it could have complemented it, and I think you're out of earshot by the time you reach the plants. Beyond that, this one has me a little stumped as to what the point was, beyond possibly putting mind-controlling food in people's homes. The last one is just theater radiation. No more of this fancy stuff. Just dose the bastards, and see what happens. So they modified a reactor to do this, and then people will be exposed to it as they walk past. To be fair, as we shall find out later, this radiation isn't as harmful as what the reactors would normally admit, nor is it as harmful as we shall see, as what they have experimented with in the past. But still, this is just really lazy. It seems to cause fatigue issues, but oddly enough also causes sleep deprivation, which then triggers paranoia. Though they say it's only potential, so I guess when these terminal entries were wrote, they still needed more data. The last entry tells us of every one of the workers who is inflicting each of these four experiments on the tour participants, or at least the individuals that have more of an inside track of how things worked here. These are Hodgson, Grunner, Dallas, Bartlebean, and Langston. I don't have a violin small enough to play for these five. 
For the most part, they deserve everything that happens to them, which is a lot, as we'll see. Also, the expected results state it varies by experiment, so it may be that they aren't all being subjected to all four of them like the people who came through here, but maybe just one or two over an extended period of time. We'll see the results of this soon. Now, we can go through and actually see the emitters for experiment 3. They aren't particularly subtle. I mean, it just looks like something is definitely being sprayed on you. So why no one thought it was odd is beyond me. You wouldn't just think, oh, it's probably just green because of plants. Or at least, I would hope you wouldn't think that. The narrator asks you to smell the freshness. So, I guess that was enough to throw people off. Also, all the plants in here are mutated varieties not pre-war veg and fruit. I just thought that was a funny little detail. Either that or one of the traders was in fact set up in here and growing fruit. We'll find one of them later, but if that was the case, it's odd that no one disabled the incredibly damaging experiments that were being carried out here. Next to this botanical area, we can find the exhibition showing off research. It's here we find the only other old body in the main part of the tour, except in Bateman's. They've expired just by a table with some chemistry equipment on it, and the how of it is, again, a mystery. We don't know if they were an employee or not, as we do find more of them later, but they're likely pre-war, or just from shortly after, given what we know of how the traders had to break through rubble to get into the park in the first place. Attached to this is the room that would have exposed people to the theater radiation, and it's in here that we get another of the spacesuits we need for the Hobologist quests. I'll point out that we still get a large amount of rads from this, as well as the detrimental effect that it gives you, in accordance with what was described in the terminal. After this, we can begin to exit the tour. However, the room with the large replicas of planetary bodies needs to be looked at first. In here, we find yet another body of a traitor. This time there's no robots lying around to indicate what may have happened. However, I think it's safe to assume this is where they came to hide after the defense protocols were enacted. If the robots didn't get them, the long-term exposure to the experiments may have, as there's no guarantee that the safety measures, such as they were, were still in place here after all this time. Heading down the exit tunnel, we come to the last area people stopped off in before leaving. Here we can find, to the right, the body of likely another employee. Again, they seemingly expired at their desk. Around them, you can find some posters relating to questions that are frequently featured in the vault's goat. To the left of the area is the last terminal outside of the research ones, and it details the seals process used to get people to sign up to the vault program. The first entry is the seals instructions, which tells the employees they need to convert visitors into possible applicants. However, due to the limited amount of time in which they'll have to do this, they have a process. Introduction, initiation, and integration. The last thing it says is to inform the supervisors of any illness or strange behaviours of the visitors. This is presumably so they can catch anyone on the way out who has been affected by the experiments here, and that may have been otherwise missed by the surveillance. Entry 2 covers the first step of the seals, introduction. A nice firm handshake and non-dirty joke are a good salesperson's openers. Then, bribery with food to get them on your side. Now honestly, I don't really understand why anyone who has been hired to make seals doesn't already realise how to make seals. This is basic stuff that anyone who's interacted with another human should be able to figure out. But then again, this is vault we're talking about, and they are a complete gaggle of creatures. So they presumably have a lot of smooth brains working for them. Entry 3 covers initiation. Now it's time to lie to them about how living in a vault will really be like. If that doesn't work, they are instructed to fearmonger. Now to be fair, this is completely accurate fearmongering, but still, it is clear manipulation. The whole don't make the hard sell part is odd to me, as the vault rep we see at the start of the game tries to do just that. The final entry is integration. This is the part where the applicant signs their life away to the vault corporation. Given the talk of a limited time to make sales, I assume all this is done without consultation of the contract by the applicant. Moreover, there's nine forms, each of which needs to be filled out in quintuplicate. 45 forms to be filled in, there is no way someone's reading all of that. Most of them even have names that just saying them out loud should tell you that your rights have been infringed. You know, like the literal rights revocation charter and liability waiver. They are told to put them all in the correct bins, 
or the whole process must be started again. Having looked at all of that, the last thing to concern ourselves with is the ultimate fate of those who worked here, i.e. the five researchers who themselves were subjects. Before that, on the right, we can find the last employee who seems to have died in their chair, possibly before the bombs after losing the will to live. Heading down the stairs to the left of the terminal, we can find the remains of the five employees, and it's clear immediately that something kicked off in here. Two of them are slumped over their desk, with the one on the left looking like they were trying to use it as cover of some sort. Behind them, in the next room, we can find a third body. But we'll get to that later. They seem to have also died at their desks, though the timeline for that is a little uncertain, given what we learn about what happened down here. Looking at the only terminal in this room, we can see it belongs to a J. Hodgson, one of the employees named to be a subject of the four experiments here, and an operations engineer. Their first entry tells us it was created on their first day here, and they seem to have worked in the DC office, which I believe is the same office we covered in a video seven or more years ago. They only have to make sure the place doesn't go up in flames and give the odd tour every now and again. The give a tour part is important, as this is likely how they began to be affected by the experiments. Entry 2 shows just how ignorant they were of what was going on. They thought an old man collapsing was just a sickness, and were then lied to by Bateman, though they find the explanation quite odd. Since the old man collapsed, I assume this was as a result of either Experiment 1 or Experiment 4, both of which affect motor function or have issues with fatigue. The third entry is where we begin to see how the experiment was affecting them, though before that, given their comment about Bateman locking themselves out and their proximity to Experiments 1 and 2, I wonder if they were beginning to be affected by them. We don't really know if they possessed any protections. As for the anger and headaches, I think Experiment 2 caused these symptoms in Hodgson. One thing I do find odd though, if they knew about the observation room, what was it they thought was being observed, and why, given that they didn't seem to know about the experiments? The second last entry is when they really begin to feel it. They can't remember writing the last entry, and Bateman is now accusing them of drinking on the job. Now, there is a bottle of drink in the bin next to this terminal, though I think this entry was in April, so I don't know why it would still be there. But if they are drinking, and they did write that entry, then the first experiment has affected their memory. If, however, that isn't the case, then Bateman is altering their terminal, and planted the bottle to gaslight them, and Experiment 4 may be making them paranoid. By Entry 5, they know something is wrong, as people in the exhibit are beginning to act strange, and do some pretty weird shit. The headaches are again being caused by Experiment 2, and they do seem to be forgetting more, meaning the first experiment is also affecting them. This seems to indicate that they are mostly, or exclusively, being subjected to Experiments 1 and 2. The last entry seems to have happened in May, so we don't know what happened to them after this. From what else we find on here, however, it's clear that this was definitely badly affecting all the other researchers here. To what extent, at least, for the two in here and the one in the locker room, we can only speculate. I do think the body in there was Hodgson, however, as everyone else we find is at a desk, and we can pretty much identify or eliminate them based solely on that. Last thing to look at in here is the two bodies of what looked like proper researchers, and as we shall see, they knew about the experiments on the tour guides, and suspected about the ones on themselves later. Both of them are dead, one of them has a gun, and we need to read their terminals to find out why. The terminal on the right belongs to Grunner, and they oversaw the theta radiation observation. Their first entry was when the reactor was modified to emit it in the first place. They comment that it is not particularly damaging, which is true, has no lasting effects, debatable, and works very quickly. Can confirm. This seems to be in contrast to a previous experiment where, given their comments about doctor reports and aftercare, was far more damaging, and likely did involve ionizing radiation. So my sympathies for them are not particularly high, to be honest. Entry 2 states that the initial results are great, expanding a little on the effects it has with tiredness, dizziness, losing track of where they are, and slurred speech. They say it lasts for at least 5 minutes, and they'll be sending their work to vault the next day. Entry 3 is just 4 days after this all started, and the data is pretty much the same. They say Bateman is very overbearing, and they can't do anything recreational. They want to increase the settings, and Bateman says they need long-term results at constant levels. 
This isn't a great explanation, as none of the results are long-term due to the brief exposure. It was likely here where they began to suspect that somebody else was the long-term subject. Langston, identified as the body to the right, gets to change their results all the time, unlike themselves. Their fourth entry shows the beginning of the effects. They fell asleep and they don't remember it, and they begin to wonder if the theatre radiation isn't being pumped in here, and they are in fact the long-term subject. They couldn't find any evidence of this after tearing the place apart, but then it also causes paranoia, so it's not like a lack of evidence was going to appease them. It could also be experiment one as well, given the memory loss, but we can't be sure. The second last entry shows the full effects of the paranoia. They suspect both Langston and Bateman of conspiring against them, and their solution was barricade themselves in the room and shoot anybody who walked in. Hmm. I kind of seen this one coming, and I don't know how you couldn't predict what long-term paranoia would do to someone. The last entry ends with 920, and the other ones all have 9 in them as well, suggesting this all happened within the same month. However, this entry kind of throws a wrench in that. If Langston was saying seal the vault and the bombs are falling, that would have been a month later, in October. However, I do think all these entries happened very close together, as the first three were in the same week. They killed Langston when he ran in. However, this is where we must consider that he is incredibly untethered from reality. They say that they locked the room down, but Langston was just able to run in, and the override isn't mentioned. They aren't even sure if they actually locked the doors anymore. The headaches and dizziness could be the fatigue, but they could also be from experiment one or two. From what they said at the end, they turned the gun on themselves. Now, due to their confusion, this could have happened in September, and Langston didn't say any of this. However, that doesn't explain why their bodies were left here. So more likely, they weren't accurately dating their entries, if they did start in September, like the numbering suggests, due to the effects of the radiation. Or the numbers don't correlate with dates, and this all happened over a longer period of time. In that case, they just killed Langston when the bombs hit, and then took care of themselves. Next, it's time to take a look at Langston's entries, who was the subliminal suggestions tech in charge of what played in the second experiment. Entry 1 states that the frequency at which the emitters were at was increased, and they can see no difference. We also learn about the colour coding that went with the tapes, learning about the blue and orange grades. Blue seems to be fairly mundane stuff that you wouldn't really notice. However, they seem to have free reign to change the tapes as they see fit. Entry 2 is where the real manipulation comes in. Apparently, there is a correlation, and as such, from their results, possibly a causation between the degree of apprehension to a particular suggestion and their susceptibility to the frequency. If I'm reading this right, the more averse they are to doing what the subliminal suggestion is telling them to do, the more effective the frequency they emit is at persuading them. The theory posited by Bateman is that the tone they emit, i.e. the frequency, causes the release of endorphins. If they are adverse to a suggestion, their body releases adrenaline. The combination of these two creates something like addiction. Now, presumably, the side effect of this chemical reaction is the symptoms detailed in Bateman's terminal. Entry 3 shows that the orange tapes may be just a little too much. This is because the compliance of a subject with a suggestion that affects other subjects, not just themselves, can have unintended consequences. In this case, it was the throwing of hands. They admit that they're slightly scared of the orange tapes, as they can lead to violence. They then mention the red grade tapes, and hope they never have to use them. The final entry shows that Langston was an asshole, and was prepared to overcome their fear of the orange tapes, just because they got bored. We see that it caused the theft of someone else's bevs, thievery, and the previously mentioned pants pissing. Possibly because the frequency was different this time around, as they wanted this to be analysed alongside the tape. Now we can assume Langston was shot by Grunner shortly after this. However, I have to now wonder if the red grade tapes didn't play a role here. Grunner never was able to find where the theta radiation was being pumped in from, and they did mention headaches. They also killed someone, so I can imagine the red grade tapes being responsible for that. We, however, don't hear anything, so we can confirm this. So the two in that room are Grunner and Langston. I think the one in the shower room, given they are the only one not at a desk, is Hodgson. That just leaves the final two, which are certainly Dallas and Bartleby. As to what happened to these two, I have no idea. To be honest, I'm not really sure what happened to Hodgson either. We can speculate 
that they all died due to radiation exposure, like the other workers here likely did. But this may not be the case. It could be that they ended themselves, or each other, as a result of the various experiments. Honestly, the red grade tapes, coupled with paranoia from the theta radiation, could definitely have done it. Unfortunately, it's hard to determine as we're missing two of the terminals here, due to damage. We can assume Bateman didn't die with these five, as they're still in their office, and these five likely wouldn't have had easy access, as they didn't know they were subjects. Overall, this was textbook, vault tech tomfoolery. Four experiments affecting brainwave interference, subliminal suggestion, hypnotism via chemical release, and theater radiation exposure. The park goers were the supposed test pool, being exposed to each of the four in varying amounts as they navigated through the tour. However, the true long-term subjects were the technicians, unaware participants in the experiments they oversaw the infliction of on others. I am sure it will shock you to hear I have little sympathy for them as a result. Maybe with the exception of Hodgins as they didn't seem to have a clue. We don't know the extent of Dallas's and Bartlebean's culpability in all this. Regardless, they were all vault employees, so they probably knew enough to deserve their fate. As a final aside, we can find some of the remains of one last skeleton as we approach the area with the trees. I have no idea who this could be. Likely another unfortunate tour participant that didn't survive. Now, to take a look at the regions to the right of Star Control. We will start by heading down the escalators to get to one of the rides here in the park which we can harvest some star cores out of. As we head down them, we can find the remains of other park cores who clearly got took out just as they were heading to the next level of the park. Heading all the way down, we come to an avenue in front of the Robco Battle Zone, the last indoor area we shall take a look at. Opposite it is a giant Mr. Handy ride called the Handy Whirl. Going on to the ride itself, we can find another skeleton of a person with their priorities right. They, like others here, seem to have died clutching their tickets. Given where we find them, I don't think it likely they died immediately like some other people. Seems they managed to crawl here from the seats on the ride. To the left of this ride, we begin to find yet more victims, struck down while being ripped off, as there's no way most of the games located in these stalls weren't rigged. I'm not saying they deserve to die, far from it, but come on, you know what you're signing up to with these games. Now, the last building to take a look at is the Robco Battle Zone. The foyer is the first thing that we see, and the abandoned pram in it is never a good sign. The whole thing is wrecked, and to be honest, that isn't going to get any better as we go deeper in. The first thing of note is the wide array of Robco robots that line the walls directly behind the spectator seats. Some of them are fairly pedestrian, and some of them have been given a paint job, which, as we shall see, still makes them pedestrian, and had the fans none too happy. The reason for this was that they were told they would be seeing never-before-seen models fighting to the death, and while the latter may have been true, the former was a load of horseshit. Looking at the stands themselves, it's clear that, while there was a show at the time, there doesn't seem to have been a huge amount of attendees. It is reasonable to assume that these are all of them, as I don't see why some would die in their chairs and others wouldn't, nor do I understand why a vast majority of the bodies, if it was fuller at one point, would just disappear inexplicably. So not doing too well just before the bombs hit, and some terminal entries we shall see later may hold the key as to why this is. Underneath the spectator seats, at the back of the building, we can find a rundown souvenir shop. There's still a functioning protector on here, and a back exit you can use to get entry to this place a little less contested. To the left of this shop, we can encounter an Assaultron that demonstrates not only their superior intelligence, but the majesty of Star Control. Just look at that superior pathfinding. Marvel at it. I kid, of course. This is definitely just the game's pathfinding being its usual janky self. But I just thought, given we know that there were malfunctions, that this was hilarious. Unless, of course, a game dev put this here on purpose, but I don't recall it being here before. Heading into the battle arena itself, we can see where these per robots were pitted against each other in lethal combat. On the floors and walls, we can find several panels that open to reveal the contenders in this area. Yes, this is something you can blunder into, and as such get bodied by these lazy attempts at making the robots look original. Or you can be smart about it and avoid that. Back outside, we can head down the stairs into the maintenance section. Here, we can find a few things of interest. 
The first thing I want to bring your attention to is this traitor. They seem to be yet another one of the poor bastards that fled the ensuing robotic slaughter initiated by the Star Core removal. They, like many, didn't get far. However, I do find it impressive they managed to make it all the way down here, given the large volume of robots present in this building, that were otherwise already active, as far as we know, as some robots were still active in the park even before the defensive protocols were engaged. However, they suffered the same fate. The other thing is this terminal that is running a diagnostic on a sentry bot. As you can see, the options are to detonate it or reactivate it, knowing it will just attack everything. I chose to detonate it, as I want its power cores, but you are free to do whatever. Also of interest is that this does trigger the other robots, but even though they are saying kill, they don't attack you. Now, the last order of business is the management area at the back, where a few terminal entries give us some more insight into this place. The first entry is from a GF Gainsborough, the head of programming. Immediately, we get an example of the dangers that the modifications these robots were under presented. A Novatron exploded, and by a miracle, the safety glass managed to hold back a fusion explosion and not murder many of the spectators. No one seems to have been hurt, but still, not a great look. They cut down the amount of shows they had in a day by a quarter, because apparently it was the increased strain that caused this. Now the question has to be asked if it was increased strain due to the performances, or due to the star control system. The second entry is from a H. Carroll, head of public relations. This is in regards to the spectators feeling they've been ripped off. You can see why, due to the fact that all they did was slap some new paint on many of the robots. Apart from that, functionally, they're identical to robots that most people will be familiar with. With the possible exception of the Assaultrons, because come on, why would a member of the public have any regular contact with them? Regardless, they have no comment, and just say to get them to fill out a complaint form. I'm not even sure if, at the end of the 12 to 18 weeks, they actually get their money back. It seems more like one of those, let's make them wait long enough until they forget, kind of deals. The final entry is by Gainsborough, and someone has finally died. A Tim Whittingstone was killed by one of the robots. Now it was ruled as accidental, and let's be honest, it probably was. However, the fact that they would still have no liability, given the previous incidents, and the live ammunition is surprising to me. They bring attention to the modified combat AI, which is likely in reference to the star control modifications being used to allow them to function within the arena in an effective manner. The final few lines seem to imply that the power source wasn't removed before maintenance had begun, so some of the fault may lie with Tim. However, I still feel like a malfunction due to star control was the cause, and since it isn't the only one we've heard about so far, the system was clearly being overworked. This whole arena feels like the riskiest region in the entirety of Galactic Zone. They literally had not only live ammunition robots walking around, but they were trying to use star control to execute combat-based instructions on them, while also controlling other robots in a non-combat manner. They were just asking for trouble, in my opinion. Now for the last section of the park. The first thing we need to take a look at is the ride created by Arcjet, a company we covered the research center of way back when Fallout 4 came out. On a bench in front of said ride, we find yet another parkour who is either on the bench or very near it when the blast hit that probably killed them. Entering the back entrance of the ride, we can find yet more bodies of those on it when the bombs hit. Now to the best of my recollection, these bodies were originally on the ride itself, and when I turned it on, they clipped through and fell down here. I could be wrong on that, but I'm fairly sure it's what happened. Either way, if the ride was at its peak at the time, they would have gotten a good view of the world ending. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, time to cover the galaxy ride. No, I may cover it in a separate video, but honestly, I just didn't think there was much in it to cover, given its large interior size. Yes, I know you can actually use the ride. If you would like me to cover it in a separate one, comment on the post for this video I left on my community page, or in the comments below. But apart from that, I, I'm just of the opinion there isn't really a lot there. Now, all that is left to do is check the only holotape left to us in the park that we find on the body of a traitor called Emerson Gates. Though, oddly enough, the holotape gives us that information and not the body itself. Kendall screwed us all. We only needed an hour or two to round up the cores, but that bastard wouldn't wait. I barely made it to my 
first console when I heard the shots. Defensive mode. And without the cores, he can't control it. Now I'm pinned down behind some godforsaken concession stand. I don't know what happened to the others. Unlike Coulter's gangs, these robots don't sleep. There's no way out. It's just a matter of time before they find me. So this was clearly recorded just after the disaster the candle started. We find out that he was clearly so impatient that he wouldn't even wait an hour before he enabled defensive mode, as that is apparently all it would have taken to get star control in a state where they could have correctly utilized defensive mode. From her comments about not being able to control it, it is then likely that there were parameters we never got to see. Parameters that, if correctly set, would have prevented the defensive mode from acting as it did and killing all of the traitors. As it stands, they were not able to configure correctly, as emergency mode was enabled as soon as defensive mode was, locking them out until a sufficient number of cores were retrieved. Once we retrieved every star core, we can get the system back up to full capacity. I will point out that you don't in fact need all 35 cores to unlock the case. As you can see when you do, the issue was corrupted software preventing the locks from being released. Whatever security was in place preventing a bypass needed the full functionality of star control to bypass it. This seems like a poor choice to me. What would happen if there was an emergency and all the cores were as spread out as they currently were when we arrived here? Remember, the ones present in various other regions of this park and others weren't all placed there by traitors. So if there was something that would damage the armor, like a fire, I'm not sure what the plan was. Then again, it is ridiculously powerful armor, so maybe that just wasn't a worry. Regardless, not having another way to bypass a fault like this seems like a stupid design decision. The quantum power armor itself is Mark V X01 armor, which as you know was a retconned armor that was originally meant to be an enclave only power armor set, i.e. developed after the war. Yes, we can make the argument that it was just experimental, so it could just be that it wasn't widespread. But we get several pieces of information in previous games that suggest this armor was unseen until the Enclave showed up, whereas we find it just hanging around at various points in the game. You can get more information in my retcon video if you'd like. So this was Galactic Zone, a region of the overall park that was meant to demonstrate futuristic technology and also promote various facets of space travel along with the technologies of several companies, like Robco, Arcjet, and vault -Tec. All the robots and rides in the park are controlled via the Star Control System, a redundant management system for both robots and machinery, to allow commands outside of the regular programming to be issued. The cores for this system were redundant, in that it could function with missing cores, and new ones could be added without issue. Throughout our inspection of the entries of various terminals in the various sites around the park, we find that the system just didn't work as well as intended. Older models of robots ran into frequent issues with the instructions they were being sent, and numerous demands for hardware overhauls by technicians were ignored. Injuries and damages began to emerge, to the point where Brad Burton himself was looped into the discussion. However, this never saw a resolution, as Armageddon came to the park. Before this, vault -Tec were also at work here, behind the scenes. They set up an exhibit that not only let them advertise their technology, and get new residents for their vaults, but, as always, to experiment on people. This had two experiments, the first target of the park goers coming into the exhibit, the second, the technicians and engineers that were administering the experiments on the first set of subjects. Though, to be fair, it seems not all of them were aware of what was going on. Eventually, one of the technicians realized what was going on, or their paranoia led them to suspect it, and they snapped, killing a co-worker and then turning the gun on themselves. The rest of their co-workers either succumbed in a similar manner, or were killed when the bombs were dropped. Due to the Armageddon that came to the park, neither vault experiments or the issues with star control ever reached a resolution. Centuries later, a trader group including Tiana and Kendall Alston, as well as Emerson Gates, started scavenging the Galactic Zone. They began to extract star cores, and Tiana identified them as redundant and began to strip the rest of the park for parts to trade. Eventually, given the arrival of Coulter's gang, Kendall decided to enable the, as of yet, even pre-war, untested defensive protocol. Tiana warned him that they wouldn't have enough cores to manage it, and they needed at least an hour to pull them from the rest of the park. Kendall didn't listen, and enabled the system. However, due to lack of cores, 
the system suffered a failure and booted into emergency mode. The defensive protocol was enabled, but presumably not properly configured, and the robots began to systematically hunt down and kill all the traitors present here. We arrive shortly after this to witness the aftermath of all of this and deal with the robots ourselves. When all was said and done, it was Kendall's greed and fear that took the lives of his fellow traitors and, in the end, his daughter. All that was left was to stumble across their futile attempt at escape and to piece together their tragic story. But in the end, it was all worth it as we got a slapping set of power armor.